I'd like to um, begin to acknowledge we are gathered here today on the traditional lands of the Wadawurrung people and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. My name is Alex Boston and I'm the Communications Manager for Deacon Research. Um, and empowering women is a passion of mine, especially young women. I have a daughter. Um, and when I think about how quickly the world's been changing, I think about the climate change, you know, the energy, the way we communicate, um, the future of our society. I often think of jobs and careers in STEM. So that's science, um, mathematics, engineering, medicine, and technology. Um, have you ever heard of pointless jobs? They're jobs that maybe you might not turn up to one day and no one would notice. A bit like maybe my job. So I'm sorry to any of the buying comms or marketing people in the room, but um, you know, if I didn't turn up tomorrow, it wouldn't change the future too much. You just wouldn't hear about the fantastic work that these women are here doing on my left, because no one would be there to communicate them. But their, their work would go on and they'll still be making groundbreaking um, research and innovation into aspects of um, our lives that will make real impact to the way we live in the future. Um, and I think if I could go back to when I was 13 or 14, um, I'd probably choose a different career. And a career in STEM is a choice. It's not about being smart. It's about choosing to be passionate about the world around you. So if you're passionate about the clothes you wear, what materials it might be made of in the future, the nanotechnology around that, if you're passionate about climate change, if you're passionate about space or stardust or you know the medicines that we need or the way we treat the way we treat the health of our populations. Uh, if you're passionate about phones and apps and making video games, these are things that all are STEM career choices and it's not about being smart, it's just about being curious. So everyone in this room can choose a career in STEM if they want to. Um, but let's have a look about what's happening today. By the time you're in year 12, there will be two boys for every girl in advanced maths and three boys for every girl in physics. And did you know only 16% of Australian careers in STEM are made up by women? Um, and did you know that the jobs in tech and STEM will be create the future wealth of um, the next generation? And let's look at the health sector because we're part of Health Research Week here. Did you know that 80% of medicines are withdrawn from the market due to the side effects of women? 80%, that's mind-blowing. It's investigated, tested, manufactured, explained to doctors and prescribed to patients and then withdrawn. Now why is this? The absence of women from science is the absence of entire aspect of our culture. We need to be there when the big decisions are made that shape our world. Women tend to ask different questions and take different approaches to science. And we think differently and I think that's a good thing. Now let's meet the women who, unlike me, were led by either their hearts, their heads, their passion or their parents into rewarding careers in STEM. An extraordinary, intelligent, creative bunch of ladies who are tackling the big ideas and problems of the future and they're going to have a real impact in the way that we live. I can't wait to hear their stories. I'd like to begin with Maria Forsyth. Um, she's a true scientific pioneer professor whose many achievements as a researcher, leader and mentor make her an outstanding role model for women in science. Her work is shaping the future of clean energy and energy storage and contributing to a cleaner, more sustainable world. Over to you. Can we just stand up? I'll stand up. Okay. Thank you very much, Alice. And um, I couldn't agree with more with everything that you that you said. I understand. We do need more women in science. We need more women in doing STEM. Um, so my history, I'm just going to tell you a bit about myself and how I got to do what I'm doing now, and also about what I do and why I love what I do. So at your age, um, I guess I was a nine year ten student. I was doing um, history, geography, math, science, the usual subjects, and I loved everything I did. I had a choice. I had a choice. But what I really loved is understanding how things worked. So I remember walking down the street with a power pole. Do you know how the trees conducted down these power poles? I don't know why I thought that, but that's, I was a bit of a nerd. So I really liked understanding how things worked, and that was partly why I chose to do physics and, and back then it was pure and applied maths and chemistry. But I still also loved actually the, the arts, so I still kept my hand in languages as well. So I, I don't think it's one or the other, I think you can do both. 
But STEM allows you to do uh, a lot more in terms of your, your career, in terms of where you can apply it, whether it be as, as you just heard about, um, in health and engineering or, or in computer apps. So for me, at the end of uh, my year 10, I did the science um, pathway uh, with my languages, um, which became kind of useful. Um, and when I finished year, in year 12, computers were just coming to the fore. I mean, you can't believe that now, I'm sure, but we did not have mobile phones. Um, we, year 11, we got our first Apple, whatever it was, um, Macintosh, which we had five inch floppy disks. You wouldn't even know what a floppy disk is probably now, which had like, I don't know, and kilobytes of memory on it. It was really, you know. But, but I loved learning how to program in basic. That was a language that was basic. And then Fortran came later, and now it's gone into what languages. Um, but I really enjoyed that. And at the time, computer science was just beginning to be um, a, a potential career. But it wasn't at university. I could have gone and done a six months degree in computer programming and gotten a job somewhere, because that was how early it was back then. But I also love chemistry. I love maths, but I also love chemistry. I love physics. I thought, well, maybe I should go to university and try Try, get, try some science, try engineering, because if I do engineering, I'm not getting a job. That's what I thought. That's why I did chemical engineering in my first six months of university um, to get a job. But I also loving maths, so I chose to do a double degree in maths and engineering. So I did a maths stream of science and what I thought was going to be chemical engineering. Six months into it, I thought, mm, this is not for me. It's not really solving, it's, it's learning a lot of, a lot of it's using maths, sure, but it's processes, it's not what I like. Many of the other girls were doing chemical engineering, they loved it, it wasn't what I liked. But what I discovered was a thing called materials engineering, material science, and I thought, materials, what is this? I've never heard of this before. Well, what it was basically was taking chemistry and physics and maths and understanding how to make new materials, not just textiles, but things like metals, ceramics, glasses, polymers, uh, materials that we now use in our batteries, which is what I currently do, um, in solar cells, uh, you name it. So basically, I suddenly discovered something I was really passionate about, understanding how to design, it's very creative, how to design, understand new materials for particular applications. I, I was always solution driven, so I always wanted to solve a problem. And so for me, um, the problem started from making new um, glasses for optical fibers, which you know, Again, back when I was young, your age, you know, it was copper wires everywhere. Um, now it's optical fibers from then to now, optical fibers. Not that old, by the way, but, but things have progressed very, very fast. Um, but back then, the fibers that, were, that we now use, silicon fibers, we thought it was being not the best. So we're doing research and trying to develop new materials that will be better. Um, and from there, I moved into something completely different. I've moved into how to um, understand materials for freezing embryos and freezing, um, we didn't have stem cell research, so we're looking at how we can store kidneys and lungs and hearts and we freeze them and then thaw them out and need them, for example, that didn't work. But that was my research my PhD. And I don't know how, but somehow or other, I found my way in batteries. So the path, I meandered my path a long way around, but all the time, what is the, what was the, um, the core of my, of my, my driving force, I guess, was the passion for understanding chemistry, physics, using maths um, to solve problems. So eventually that's where I landed, looking at new materials for batteries. So back in, before you guys were born, back in 1990, I was in America, and I uh, started looking at lithium batteries. Lithium iron batteries now are in every single one of our devices, in my Fitbit, in your computers, in your, in your phones, and pretty much everything. Um, but that was just the beginning. Like, we didn't have those things back in 1990. It was the beginning of it. And from then until now, I'm still driven by looking at um, developing new, new materials for better, cheaper, more reliable, safer energy storage. Now, why do we need energy storage? Because at the moment we're still burning fossil fuels. I think for most of you, hopefully all of you, understand that we currently are in a, in a crisis situation with climate change uh, and that we have to start looking at alternatives. Science allows you to contribute to that, that alternative. It allows you to start developing new technologies for making energy, new technologies for storing energy. But also, what I've become passionate about in the last 12 months, actually, is that what we create now, we don't create a problem in 20 years' time that coal created 50 years ago. So, you know, 50 years ago, whatever it was up burning coal, no one thought about climate change. Okay, but, but now we're looking at using wind turbines and solar panels and batteries. As a scientist, what you guys are contributing to is what's called the circular economy. In other words, the things that we now do, 
there is a circular pathway to it. We're not making more rubbish that someone, you know, your, your children and grandchildren have to clean up. So science is going to play a very big part in not just solving the existing problems, making sure we don't create new problems. And that's what drives me right now. In terms of why, why the other pop perks being a scientist, I mean, my, my, I run a team of about 50, 50 people, roughly, students, postdocs, men and women. Unfortunately, mostly men, because it still is very male-dominated, but it's men and women. And um, we, we sort of, in our research, we do a lot of research in, in energy, as I just said, but we get to travel all over the world. So I have to spend two months with San Sebastian, where I have a sort of collaboration. Science is a very collaborative um, endeavour. You don't do it by yourself. You work with other people. You work with classmates in a lab when you're at school or undergraduate. You work with your um, your peers, your your, your um, other students, other researchers who are doing research. If you're in a team working in a company, you're working with other people. It's very collaborative. And it's also very international. So you really get to meet people from all over the world. You can travel all over the world. Um, you get people traveling to visit you. It's, it's a really exciting career. It's one that, for me, has given me a lot of um, fulfillment, uh, both in, in training young people, in, in, in making new discoveries, and in, in solving real world problems. So to my 15 year old self, I would say, Stick to science, do maths, do chemistry, do physics, or at least one of those. And or biology too. I, mean, I didn't do biology when I was in year 12, but, but that's still a very important science. And my son, in fact, is in biology, so it's, it's an important science. Um, but do one of those, and, and, and because that, that science, that STEM, will allow you to make a contribution that will contribute to the, a better world, basically, whether it be clean energy, whether it be better health. So I say to myself, stick to science. Um, and, and make science your career as you, as you get to the IH, make science your career. So, um, anyway, I hope I'll, I'll give you a bit of my story and I hope you uh, get something from that. I hope you answer questions later on. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Maria. Um, I like those comments that it's very collaborative. And yeah, the career is not just at a university, it's with the industry. Um, yeah, as Maria said, lots of travel. It's really, it's what you make of it. Next, I'd like to introduce Tanya. Um, Tanya and her team have consistently performed ground, groundbreaking, world-changing research on a truly humanitarian proportions. Their global footprint in investigating malaria will have life-changing impacts on the health populations in third world countries who are most vulnerable to this disease. But I'll let Tanya tell you her story. Thanks so much. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey as a whole, and then um, what I think are some benefits of doing STEM, and then also why it's important for women to be involved in STEM. So I'm like a girl. I grew up in Hyden, went to um, early primary school, and then to Belmont High. And when I was your age, I wasn't really thinking about careers. I was just thinking about what I really liked at school and what subjects I wanted to do anymore. So I, I loved maths, I loved problem solving, I loved biology, and I liked um, understanding how things work, particularly the human body. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, I always did very well at school, but I wasn't one of those super smart um, students. Actually, as one of my biology teachers said, um, you just work very hard to get, to get the marks that you do. So, um, what I found kind of hard was when people would always say to me, what do you want to do as a career? And I think it's really hard at 15 and 16 to think about careers because, I mean, how are you expected to know, really? I mean, you haven't been out there in the world, you don't even know what's, what's available out there. And also, some of the jobs that are going to be around in five years' time might not exist today, so it is really, really hard. Um, so I just kept doing my maths, my biology, my chem, just because I really, really um, enjoyed it. But one of the things I did do when I was in um, year 11 is I started going to the university open days just to have a bit of a look at what kind of courses were out there and just to see what interested me in the broad sense and what kind of subjects were prerequisites, just so that I kept the door open so I you know, had, had a chance to do multiple different things if I wanted to. When I was in year 12, and you know, you've got to put your preferences down for what course you want to do, I was a little bit um, nervous, and like Maria, I was thinking, I better choose a job that, I better choose a course that is a career at the end of it. And so I chose medicine, because I thought, well, I know, if you do medicine, you're going to be a doctor at the end of it. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about science. Well, what do you do with science? Um, what do you become? 
And of course, I know now that with science you can come anything that you really want to, um, but I didn't know that then. So it turns out that I didn't get into medicine, because I said to you that I really wasn't the top of my class. I um, didn't get into medicine, and so I did science at Melbourne Uni, and I did bio, chem, and maths, and still really loved all those um, things. And so it wasn't until second year uni that I started doing some special subjects, microbiology, immunology, and pathology, and that really resonated with me. I really enjoyed that and thought, hmm, maybe I'll become a diagnostic microbiologist. I'd like to understand what makes people, what bugs make people sick so that we can treat them. Um, but then in my third year, I actually had done quite well and I was offered the opportunity to do honours, which is a year of um, research. And that's another thing I would always advise is that I kept my kind of marks up. So I, I again, to limit my opportunities so that I could um, get into, um, to do whatever I wanted to do. So I did a year of honours and I actually worked on a bacteria that causes diarrhoea in young children. And of course, to get into the intestine, it has to pass through the acidic environment of the stomach. So my research in my honours year was trying to understand how a bacteria can survive that really acidic environment in the stomach to get down to the intestine. And it's a hard year. I, I really enjoyed it, loved it, but you know, none of my experiments really worked. But I loved the idea of the problem solving. And then at the end of that, um, I either had the choice to do a PhD, I was lucky enough to um, get a scholarship, but I also applied for a job in a diagnostic microbiology lab. And I literally sat there with a pen and paper writing down the pros and cons of each. And one of the other things that I did, and I would always recommend you do, is to speak to people who, who work in those professions. So I spoke to people in diagnostic labs and I said, what do you really love about your job? But also what do you not like about your job? And I did that for both. And so it turns out I ended up doing a PhD um, in a similar area and then Fast forward, um, ended, up, ended up doing a, a postdoc in uh, Holland. And it's important for you to know, so I did um, molecular, um, sorry, I did uh, molecular biology. Uh, that was the core skill that I had. And um, so when I actually went over to Holland, I was offered four different jobs. One was cancer research, one was on malaria, one was a uh, vet micro, and the other one I think was yeast genetics. So you can see the diversity in the jobs that um, I applied for, and it was really because I had this molecular biology um, base. So, you know, it turned out I, I ended up choosing malaria because I thought that was just such an important disease with um, half a million um, people, young, young children predominantly dying every year from malaria, and around about two million people become infected every year. We don't have a vaccine and we've got a lot of um, drug resistance. And so I thought if I go into that, I would be making a real difference. Um, my research would make a real difference. Trying to find out new ways to develop drugs to um, target this pathogen. So um, I really love the work that I do. I now have a, a lab at Deakin University, run my own research team. Um, I supervise research students. I also actually taught medical students as well. Um, as Maria said, you get to collaborate with people all over the world. So every year I go to a couple of conferences um, around the world. Um, the research that I've published has been in, in leading international journals and the work that I do is, is making um, a real difference. So that gives me a lot of um, job satisfaction. And I think that's what's really important about STEM is that you are really making a difference. You're at the cutting edge, you're answering questions that haven't been answered before. So you're really treading on um, new ground. And so I think it's really exciting. And so every day that I work is never the same. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about going to work on a Monday morning, um, you hear about those people saying, oh, I'm work on Monday. Well, I don't feel like that because I, I really enjoy what I do. Because, I mean, when I think about it now, what I'm doing is problem solving. I'm not doing biology, I'm doing microbiology, and I'm also working on human disease. So it actually makes complete sense what I'm doing, but back in year 10, I had no idea that even people could do PhDs. So, you know, I've actually taken the journey that I guess I was supposed to take, but I couldn't see it back then. Um, so in terms of um, the skills that you learn, 
I think it's important for you guys to know that problem solving and critical thinking skills are actually the number two, the top two skills that employees are looking for. And I'm not talking about places just that do STEM-based stuff. I'm, I'm talking about the top 100 organisations in Australia. If you ask them what their skill set they're looking for, they're looking for problem solving skills and critical thinking, and that's exactly what we do with STEM. The other thing too is that the skills you learn are really transferable. So, um, you know, you can be thinking about, well, maybe I work in the education sector or the health sector, government organisations, financial institutions, all of those um, different places um, use the kind of skill set. Um, so, when you're looking at job prospects, I'd say that, you know, you can actually get a job um, anywhere. And you can also tailor it to even your own personality. So if you're a person who loves being outside, you can be doing field trips. Um, if you really love writing, you can end up becoming a science writer, for example. So you actually can really tailor the profession to, to really suit you. Um, and just, I guess, finally what I'd just like to say is how important it is for, for women to be involved in um, STEM, as we just mentioned um, earlier. But, you know, our health and our education is equally as important for women as it is for men. And I would also say we use products too. We use all these technical products. And so how can these products be suited to our needs and desires, what we want, if we're not involved in design, creating and implementing these, these things? So it's, you know, women have, you know, very creative um, insight into things. We're going to be using the products, so we should be helping to design those um, products. Um, and I think that's a message that's important for, for men to hear too, because if they knew that the companies out there that do have women employed, they actually do better than those that just, you know, are predominantly men. So, you know, women play a very important role. Um, yeah, so just if I was to go back and look at my 15-year-old self, I would still tell myself just to follow things that you're really passionate about. Um, and it can be hard because you don't know about the journey here. I would always keep one eye open to see what where your path is leading. But I think a, a career in STEM, um, you never know where those paths are going to, to lead you. Um, and things might pop up in the future that, that never even existed. So I think um, that's what's exciting about STEM. And, um, you know, I don't think you'll ever regret um, undertaking STEM-based things because I think it'll always be a challenging and rewarding um, journey. So thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Um, that was great. It's good enough for the girls to think about, especially like the um, how, and even though it seemed like now when we look back on it, such a true path, there were so many choices you got to make along the way that led you to where you are now, so that's really exciting. And next up, I'd like to introduce Sharma. Um, she's going to share a story with us now. Sharma's an engineer, a lecturer, an innovator, and multitasker, and she's an inspiring lady with bad STEM skills and a social conscious debut. So, Sharma. Um, hope you're all enjoying the discussions today around career choices. So today we are supposed to tell about what we tell uh, to our 15 year old self about career choices. So when I was 15 year old, uh, as a school girl uh, back in the 90s, then about career I knew that I want to make some positive changes to the society and the humanity. So as many of you, uh, my first role model was my school teacher because I think they're doing great jobs in shaping the future citizens of the country. And I was always fascinated about their impact on the society. But then uh, I started thinking, um, okay, is there any other way, um, or is it the only way to make an impact to the society? So as I was gradually growing up, I was developing a sense of my surroundings, um, why things happen, what are the underlying facts, so I found that uh, science is an exceptional tool that can explain uh, different phenomena and uh, probably the root cause of many of the problems that humanity and environment would face. So I got to know that uh, I want to do something in STEM and I was fascinated that there is so many career options with STEM. Maybe I can be an astrophysicist 
maybe um, I can be a um, genetic scientist or a biochemist. So there is a lot of options available with STEM. So um, then there, uh, there is a point where I need to make a choice for um, my uh, tertiary degree, what field of study I want to uh, be in after I finish my high school. So then I was uh, thinking like, uh, yeah, I want to do something uh, from STEM. Um, I was interested that uh, I can get um, science, uh, I can use science to explain uh, different um, problems and different phenomena. But then uh, how can I use these facts to design a solution to solve a problem which is uh, having an impact in the real life scenario? Is there anything that uh, can uh, use these basic principles from science and based on that uh, develop a real world solution? Then I gradually found that engineering can be such a thing through which we can uh, develop the real world solutions and design human centric technology. And I found that like, uh, if you want to design these uh, solutions for real world problems, these solutions uh, need to be, um, uh, it will depend, the effectiveness will depend on uh, technologies like telecommunications or data communications because we need to stay connected. Uh, intelligent devices uh, that will need electronic chips because we want them to act the way they should be. And most importantly, electricity or power. Otherwise, we'd be in complete darkness and we, we can't do anything with that. So I found that uh, electrical engineering can be one of those disciplines that will open up lots and lots of career options for me. I can be a telecommunication engineer, an electronics engineer, or a power system engineer. So I, uh, I feel like I want to uh, choose this field of study, so I pursue my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. So if you ask me whether that journey was very smooth and nice, I would say it's not. There were some people who always keep uh, saying that engineering and girls, they don't go with each other. Then I asked myself, why? And I tried to find that answer throughout my four years of undergraduate studies. And at the end, I got to know uh, there is nothing in, uh, that can hold back a girl from uh, being an electrical engineer. Things might be different in early days when um, everything was manual, we have to depend on heavy machines, and some people might have to work in remote sites without any toilet. Uh, but things <laughs> have massively changed now. <laughs> so it is not like this. Uh, there has been lots of changes that uh, is in the engineering, engineering sector. For example, if someone is working uh, in a power plant these days and um, uh, she has to do some uh, monitoring. She can do it from the computer screen, uh, uh, maybe from her office space or uh, even from her home. She doesn't have to uh, visit that power plant um, like every day, 24 seven. So uh, maybe she can visit the uh, actual site once in a month and then uh, the, repeat, uh, the repetitive monitoring can often be taken care of by the automation systems. So the highly automated um, uh, sector uh, has uh, opened up new opportunities uh, for new career, new types of careers. So now the sector needs more intelligent people to develop intelligent solutions, uh, not just act like machines and do the same thing again and again. Um, so if you ask me like what career options uh, are available after completing a degree in electrical engineering, I will say many. It can range from uh, like design engineers to consultants, or uh, there could be other uh, jobs like um, maintenance engineers or um, planning engineers. So uh, I have uh, some friends who work at like, Intel and develop um, some uh, electronic chips uh, to develop new types of technologies. I have friends in Telstra who develop 5G technologies for telecommunications as a telecommunication uh, research engineer. I have friends who work at ABB for developing the solution for power system, for electric, electrical power system. 
and also there are uh, some friends who work as data scientists in energy system. This is quite a new field, um, so this is different from the other other types of careers. So uh, for the energy systems, uh, they dig into the data and then they provide insights why your energy consumption went that high and how can you improve. So there are lots of options and even none of these fascinate you, there is the education sector uh, where I'm working in currently. Um, so some people ask me like, uh, do you think there are biases in the engineering profession? I would say that, um, can you tell me any profession that does not have that? Believe me, uh, it is common in every workplace because humans are prone to have biases and uh, there is always a work around these things. There are support groups available. For example, um, there are um, some uh, networking groups available for female engineers and manufacturing engineers. For example, there is Women in Manufacturing Networking Group from Genome Manufacturing Council or from Engineers Australia, there is Women in Engineering Group. So there is always lots of networking events, social communication and um, support is available. So you won't be alone if you join that field. So if you ask me like, what is the bottom line of this discussion, I would say that um, always uh, keep your career options open. So whenever there is a change, you have the flexibility to adapt to that, to make uh, yourself familiar with the changes. Second thing is uh, don't let anyone else decide what you can or can't do, you decide. So if you want to do something, if you want to achieve something, think about like what skills you need to know, what strategies you need to take, whom should you approach. So I believe like anyone can achieve anything with, uh, if they have uh, the real uh, thirst for that. And most importantly, never lose your innovative self and your ability to think out of box. Because um, the engineering sector or even the entire workforce are now looking for uh, intelligent uh, applications so that they can connect technology with um, the society and they want some intelligent minds, innovative minds to make them happen. Thank you. Thanks, John. I'm a role model. Um, I thought it was very interesting how she talks that women do support each other too in these fields and there are lots of um, societies in all, in all different professions where women can get together and, and talk through the problems that they face in the workforce and being a minority in some aspects. So it's, that's just um, part of being a woman is connecting and, and supporting each other. Uh, next, uh, we've got Erin. So, did you know that what you eat affects your mood and can be linked to depression and anxiety? Well, I didn't know that until I started working at Deakin. Erin uh, is passionate about this relationship and loves her work as a researcher and collaborator within the Deakin community. Outside Deakin, she plays AFL. What a rock star. <laughs> I'll hand it over to Erin now. Thank you. So I've got a dodgy foot, so I'm going to bring my chair from AFL, not from science. <laughs> Um, first of all, thanks so much for having me speak. Um, I know you guys will have taken so much from what all the speakers have already said because I've been so completely inspired and a lot of the things that I want to say and, and that I've written down because I, I, I really value this opportunity because I know I remember the types of challenges that, that you guys, um, you know, you're experiencing career decisions and study and all the other things going on. So I wanted to make sure what I said I got right so that's why I've got notes with me. So I thought I'd start just as, as everyone else has and just give you a little bit of background around who I am, um, where I've come from. Um, and then I've got sort of five key things that I think I would like my 15, 16, 14 year old self to know. Um, they're quite broad, so my experience is in science and also in sport and in um, both domains, uh, women have traditionally been the minority. Um, so I thought it might be useful to, to have, I guess, a broad um, things that I would like to tell myself when I was a younger person. So I grew up in Geelong, I uh, went to school nearby um, my whole life, well, primary school and high school, so I'm very, very familiar with this town. Um, I also played netball, um, and I'm sure lots of you guys will play local sport as well. Um, I started about the age of 10 at St Mary's Netball Football Club, does anyone know? Um, but you know it? 
Yeah, so I spent a whole lot of time down there as a, as a young woman um, playing netball. My brothers played football. I had so many cousins, like it was surreal how many cousins I had down at that club. And so that was really my sort of social space, what I would do on weekends and after school and whatnot. Um, the reason I bring that up is because sports have been quite a major part of shaping the skills that I have that I think have really helped me in science. Um, so I grew up playing netball. Um, at school, I, I enjoyed school. I felt like I, um, I, I could apply myself quite well. I got distracted a lot by boys um, for quite a few years, so it probably set me back a little bit. And then towards the end of school, I started to realise, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I can do this well. I want to help people. And um, I said about netball because I think I was quite competitive and I think I'd like to do well. And recognising that in myself was a very, very uh, wonderful thing because I've been able to use that um, in my career to get to where I am. Um, so I finished high school and was really interested in psychology. I was interested in mental health. I sort of grew up with um, very strong feminist beliefs and an understanding of health broadly. And I was interested in mental health because, I mean, even now there's still a real lot of stigma associated to that. And I know that school programs are getting better. Um, when I was at school, it wasn't talked about. We didn't have a counsellor. We didn't have any type of support like that, which is a real shame um, because we know, you know, just about everyone is affected by it themselves or someone else that, that might have something like anxiety or depression or you know, another common mental disorder. Um, so I uh, took up psychology, I wanted to study psychology, I went overseas um, travelling uh, for a year or, you know, um, backpacking and whatnot, um, came back and started uni and I went to a university in Melbourne because that's where my friends went from school and I thought that would make me really smart and really cool and I failed completely the, the whole year, I failed at just about every subject didn't tell anyone, of course, um, and thought, oh, hang on, what's going on here? You know, I love this. I, I'm really passionate about it. What's going on? And then I made the decision to come back to Geelong. So my, my support network were here, my friends and family, some of my friends and family were here, um, and I transferred back to Deakin University um, to take up psychology. And it was a really great decision because I didn't fail on the subject and I went through my whole degree and enjoyed it and ended up doing an honours year, which you've, you've heard about, which is a research project in your fourth year. Um, during that time, I, I'd, um, I'd been playing netball that, that whole, whole time I was at school, um, always in Geelong, never any, anything higher. And when I was 23, which is probably sounds, well, you know, might be old for you guys, but sounds quite young to me, but um, I thought I was really old and I actually started playing sport at a higher level in Melbourne. Um, so before that, I hadn't done any type of, you know, um, representative sport or anything like that. I had a lot of family responsibilities at home, um, and uh, it was just not possible to try and take up that type of thing. Um, the reason I brought that up is because uh, during my uh, degree in psychology, I had a chance to, um, to play up in Melbourne. I decided, well, I'm 23, you know, might as well give it a go. And then got um, signed up for the Melbourne Vixens team the following year. So in 12 months, I went from playing, you know, like netball not being very serious to being very, very serious indeed. Um, so I guess I, I sort of played netball and did my honours year because they worked well together. And at the end of that, um, the person I was doing my honours project with um, said, do you want to do a PhD? I said, oh, I'd love to. And then I went home and Googled PhD because then what it was. <laughs> and so I was raised that too. And you sort of didn't know. I should have known by then, but I didn't. Um, and so, you know, I thought, oh, you know, this would be good. You know, I've got a scholarship option. And, um, and, and yeah, I thought it would, would work really well with my sport. I'm saying this like I was really ignorant, but, you know, looking back, I, I recognised this is where my interest was. This is where my skills were, and that's what I wanted to pursue. But I, I sort of think a little bit it was, a, it was an opportunity that matched my circumstance as well. And one of the points I've got, got written down that I'll explain a little bit and refer back to that uh, decision. So I went into my PhD. My PhD was a, a three and a half year research project, and that was looking at the mental health outcomes of a uh, diet and physical activity intervention. So what we did was we tried to make our environment around um, schools, actually, up in Canberra, we tried to make them more healthy, essentially. We looked at the canteen, we looked at the outdoor areas, um, and we just tried to um, look at ways that you might be able to support healthy behaviours, because we know that the way we behave is not just how we think or what our parents taught us, it's also what we're surrounded by. Um, so I looked at what effect that had on mental health and there were some really promising signs there, some really exciting things. Um, so we know that mental health is defined by a huge, huge range of factors and some of them are really difficult to change. Um, you know, potentially where you live, whether you've been exposed to something as a younger person, but something like diet and physical activity, arguably we do it every day. 
all of us, we, we eat and we, we walk and we're on our phones and we, you know, we do these activities every day. So if there's some type of benefit in those behaviours to help our mental health, it could be really exciting. And so that's what my PhD assessed and has informed all my research um, to date and what I've pursued for the rest of my career. So I finished my PhD, I did a bit more travel for my research, um, and again, I'll bring that up when I get to my, my points I've got written down. Um, and then I ended up getting some funding to do uh, research back at Deakin, so I sort of did a bit of a circle, um, came back to Deakin, now I'm at the Food and Mood Centre at Deakin University, which is a really exciting research centre because it's very novel, it's very uh, new. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's sort of heard of that type of thing before, what we eat and how it interacts with our brain health and our mental health. Um, and it's based in Geelong, which is great because we should be really proud of that and the research that's emerging from Geelong as, as we've all spoken about, not just my own. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, I guess briefly, um, my, my, my journey to date has been a little bit atypical. Sport's been a major part of my experiences um, and, yeah, I genuinely love what I do. So now to my sort of five points that I've got written down here, and as I said, you, they'll be very familiar because everyone's already mentioned them. I think they're still my notes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first one is uh, all pathways are totally different. When I was um, going into my degree and my, my research, I thought, oh no, I've done this year, I failed at uni, I'm hopeless, whatever, can't do sport because I haven't done it before at that high level. It doesn't matter. No one cares. No one cares. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> No one cares. Like, everyone's story is different, and the more time you spend uh, thinking about how your story is different and how you couldn't possibly do that because it's different, or people are telling you that, stuff them. Honestly, people who are right at the top have come from all different places, they have all different experiences, and that is what makes these, um, you know, research programs and careers so wonderful because you have diverse experiences. So if anyone tells you, yeah, but you can't, Tell them what I was going to say before because it's so <laughs> um, So, yeah, so I tell myself, you might be different to others, but that's okay. Second one, um, I clearly didn't have a clear direction of where I wanted to go. I think it was definitely mentioned before. You, you can sort of see it when you end up here. Like I'm still junior in my career, but I can look back and say, oh, yeah, I liked that, didn't like that. I was, these are my skills. I could see how I got to here, um, but I couldn't see it at the time. I certainly didn't know it when I was your age. Um, and so I guess I've just written down that the things I think helped me get to where I am, a, a work ethic, and pursuing what makes me happy, which sounds a bit fluffy, but I really do mean it. You know, if something makes you happy, it's good at it, it's rewarding, it's likely a good thing to pursue. Um, the third thing I've written down is that um, <laughs> Find someone you admire and copy them, which sounds a bit creepy, but I mean like, <laughs> I mean it's a mentor, you know, um, so you guys will be familiar with the term mentor. We talk about it quite a bit in sport, yes, yes, no. So a mentor is someone that, um, you know, I guess is further progressed than you are in where you want to go. Um, so you can have, say, an explicit mentor where you say, hey, can, can you be my mentor? Can you teach me what you know and, and where you're going and, and how you got there? Um, or, and this is truly what I've done, is seeing people and seeing I'd like to be there, how did they get there? What were their steps that they took? What did they achieve? Where did they go? What did they learn? Um, so having a mentor is just so valuable and it also helps you set up you know, your goals and what you want to do and, and how you get there. Um, fourth thing I've written down is that, and this was definitely mentioned just before, um, the unique perspectives and insights that we have as women are so valuable and so, so important. And I'm getting goosebumps. And it's so sad because we basically have to speak louder to be heard. It shouldn't be the case, but it is. And there's been a lot of work that's gone before us to, to help our voices be equal to that of other people. And we're not there yet. And that's okay because we can keep going with this and we can make sure that our voices are heard. So I think it's an important thing to recognise that, um, you know, historically, we have been a minority. We still are. Um, and that is more reason why we need to be louder and pursue our goals and what we want to achieve. The last thing I've got um, written down, again, it's quite broad, but, but I thought when I was your age and, and you know, yeah, right up until still now, um, I was very tuned in to what people would tell me to do because I like to keep people happy, didn't like getting in trouble, very competitive, so I won't always do well. And I think that the older I get, the more selective I was with what advice I had. So if you know what you want to do and you have an interest, 
don't be scared to protect it and maybe take on advice that's helpful and if advice isn't helpful, be okay with, you know, maybe just storing it for later and processing a little bit later when it might be helpful. Um, you certainly have the ability to choose a pathway that you want to achieve and, um, and what's going to bring you fulfillment and happiness in your career. As I said, for me, that's been STEM and, and, and informed by sport. Um, and that keeping other people happy is unlikely to make you happy as you can be. So I know my sort of points have been quite broad, um, but as I said, certainly these are the things that I would like to hear when I was your age. And um, yeah, really happy to chat to anyone or yeah, question time or, or whatever. And, and all the very best and well done for being here today too.